your church to be dismissed. And we'll take some time uh, to pray together. Uh, just an update on uh, Marg Waits, you may have seen on the prayer chain. Uh, Marg is home now after having a, uh, what's being described as a mild uh, heart attack. I spoke, uh, spoke with uh, Orville this past week, and uh, she is resting at home, but still uh, very, very tired and um, hopefully healing from the effects of that mild heart attack. So we'll be praying for the weights. Uh, let us go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time. We thank you for this time of year where uh, we focus on the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, his first coming. And all that that means, that uh, as we have just sung, uh, the infant and the infinite, where uh, God, you sent your son, uh, who left his place in heaven, who uh, left uh, that fantastic and wonderful atmosphere to come to earth in the form of a human baby. Lord, how uh, miraculous that is, how remarkable that is, that you would take that great step to send your Son for us. Lord, help us to remember that there is no cradle without the cross, there is no cross without the cradle, that that all was part of your plan. And as he comes and we celebrate that coming, we are reminded as to why he came, so that he would die for us. So Lord, we are grateful, we are uh, joyful, for this tremendous act of love and mercy on your part. So we can sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Lord, there are a number of our people who are uh, just faced with a number of challenges at this time, and we just want to pray for them. We think specifically of the weights. We thank you that Marg is home, and she is resting there now, and Uh, much more comfortable than being in the hospital. But we pray, Lord, for your hand of healing to be upon her. Uh, Be with Orville as uh, he cares for her, Lord, and we just thank you um, that they are part of this church family. And we just ask, Lord, that they would know uh, that you are with them. Lord, I want to pray for Vi Hawley. uh, And Lord, as she just continues to uh, grieve the loss of Ralph, we pray, Lord, that you would just comfort her. We thank you for her sons and daughters-in-law who, who are there and caring for her and comforting her. And Lord, we know that uh, she has a significant move January 1st into uh, a new senior's residence, Lord, and we just pray that that'll be a good move and that will be beneficial for her. Lord, we too just want to uh, pray for all of those we know who are facing uh, struggles. Lord, we don't uh, know all of them, but you do. Lord, we just pray that At this time, this season, Lord, that they would just be reminded of who Jesus is, put their faith and their trust in you. Lord, we pray uh, against the strongholds in our community as we've been doing over the last few weeks. There are so many of them. Uh, Today, I specifically think of uh, domestic abuse and how there are uh, people living in fear of uh, their uh, spouses and their uh, domestic relationships, Lord, and Lord, I pray that uh, you would just help uh, those who are experiencing that to uh, be able to escape. Lord, uh, predominantly it's women and children affected by this, but there are also women who are abusers of uh, their male counterparts. And Lord, we just pray against this, that you will move again across this city in Brant County, that this will be reduced and people will come to you, that lives can be changed for the better. Lord, we pray for that across uh, the city that we live in. Lord, we just want to pray for uh, the Hope Pregnancy Center and Family Support Center. We thank you for the work that they are doing. The lives that are being changed as uh, women come in with crisis pregnancies and they're able to get help and they're able to get support and they're able to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. So continue to bless them. We thank you that we can partner with them in the work that they are doing. Lord, we pray too that um, 
as we look into your word briefly, that you would just open our eyes to what it is that you would have us hear, that the Holy Spirit would work among each and every one of us, that we would correctly divide the word of truth, Lord, and it may be an encouragement and a challenge to us. We pray these things in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite uh, Anna Brazier to come up, and she's going to read the scripture for us, Luke chapter 2, 8 to 20. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, you'll find it on page 1021. Yeah, that yellow. Luke 2, 8 to 20. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. I'm sure this morning as well. I just encourage you, if uh, you did happen to close your Bibles, that you'd open them again to Luke chapter 2. And we will be looking at verses 8 to 20, as well as a few other passages from the Gospel of Luke. So now it's time for our quiz, and we're going just to uh, ask a few questions about the last two sermons, so hopefully you remember more than just the words that we have been looking at. So the first candle of Advent is? Hope, yes, very good, very good. All right, and uh, we found out that uh, Jesus is the hope of the nations, that Jesus is the hope of glory, and that as believers, we are to what in hope? Abound, yes, we are to abound. It's not something that we just have a little bit of, but it is something that we are to have a lot of. The second candle is? Peace, yes, that's right, okay. And we found out that without peace, what did Luke chapter 1 tell us when uh, Zechariah was singing the, what we know as the Benedictus, right? He said that we were in what? Darkness, right? We are in darkness and we are in disorientation. And we found out that peace is about relationships. First, our relationship with God, that it is important to have peace with God, and then peace with one another. And we found out as well that peace was, can we remember Thank you. Somebody has their notes open. Yes, excellent. Well done, Sandy. Well done. It is transcendent. It covers all situations and circumstances that we may find ourselves in that we can have a peace that passes understanding. Even when we don't know what God is doing, when things in our lives are challenging and difficult, we can have a peace that is transcendent that passes understanding all understanding. And now we're going to look at our third candle. And what is our third candle? Joy. All right. Again, it's the, uh, you look at that, I was about to light to this one. And that's wrong, by the way. And we're going to talk about it in a while. The pink one is always the third candle. And this is joy. This is called the godete candle. means rejoice because when Mary sings, in Luke chapter 1, about what God has done to allow her to be the mother of the Messiah, her heart rejoices, and the Latin word for rejoice is go de te. And I just want to talk a little bit 
uh, about the wreath because we look at it, but the wreath is just full of meaning. It's not just something pretty that we drag out every Advent season. The whole wreath has meaning. So all of the colors of the candles have meaning. Uh, the wreath itself is round, right, referencing the uh, eternality of God. i just switch this a little bit so we're caught up to date, right? So we look at the eternality of God, um, but not only that, uh, it is green, meaning life, right? Evergreen, it stays green throughout the winter season. The other trees lose their leaves, but evergreens contain and continue to carry on with green. So it is green, meaning life. It is round, signifying the eternality of God. Purple represents what? Does anybody know? Royalty, right? It is royalty. And Jesus is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. So the purple represents royalty. The pink represents joy. White represents purity. It is the Christ candle. And we light them to give light in the darkness. So it has a whole message in and of itself. It's not just about lighting the candles. It is about far more than that. So today, we rejoice. We rejoice. Um, and as we move through our Advent preaching series, something should be coming, uh, should be coming apparent. Christians should be the most hopeful people, right? As believers, we should be the most hopeful people. Uh, not only that, uh, we see that we should be the most peaceful people. And on the third Sunday of Advent 2022, we'll see that Christians should be the most joyful people. So let me ask, how are we doing with that? Are Christians seen as the most hopeful people? Are we seen as the most peaceful people? Are we seen as the most joyful people? And then next week we'll add, are we seen as the most loving people? How is our testimony to the world's? Now, granted, the world is under the power of the Satan, and is doing, he is doing everything in his power to nullify and remove any influence that the church can have. His desire is to destroy the church. Please note that. That is his goal. He wants to destroy the church. He wants to keep people from acknowledging Jesus as Lord and Savior, and uh, see them essentially uh, lose like he is losing. Right? That is what he desires. So there is an enemy. But we fight not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, rulers, and darkness of spiritual wickedness. We are called to be the light, and being light means reflecting the truths we hold dear by the way we live and our attitudes and approach as we go through life. So are we seen as the most hopeful, peaceful, joyful people? Sometimes, truthfully, Christians can be known more for what we are against than what we are for. Sometimes that is true. Right now, we need to take a stand for the truth, but truth must always be combined with grace. Right? Jesus came full of grace and truth. So when we share the truth, let us be doing it with grace. Let us be doing it with hope. Let us be doing it as peaceful people, and let us be doing it with joy. I came across this article, and uh, it's called uh, Thamelios. It's a theological journal, and uh, this author, uh, his name is Robbie Castleman. He says this, Joy needs to break forth as a new rhythm of life in the middle of the mundane, in the mire of the world's misery, and even in the midst of sinners. Now, this gigantic joy has nothing to do with the thin frivolity that attempts to make church fun or worship a storefront window to get the crowd in the door. This joy is gigantic because it refuses to domesticate transcendence. Gigantic joy is rooted in the fear of the Lord. Gigantic joy is not impervious to pain or inattentive to heartbreak. Gigantic joy doesn't laugh in the middle of tsunami sorrow, broken promises, or the irrevocable. irrevocable, it's a tough word today, consequences of sinful rebellion. What gigantic joy does is give the Christian a bottomless pool of hope that allows the Christian the energy and steadfastness to not grow weary in well-doing. 
This kind of joy is the secret of being able to face sin and sorrow honestly and still end the day singing the doxology. Right? It's a joy that wells up inside of and Jesus is our joy and it needs to be seen in the believer people need to see us as hopeful peaceful and joyful so uh, three points about that uh, this morning first of all the coming of Jesus is accompanied by great joy the coming of Jesus is accompanied by great joy now uh, Luke loves the word joy and he uh, puts it throughout his gospel and in the book of Acts in very strategic places. And the coming of the Messiah is an occasion of joy. Everything surrounding the birth announcements and the birth of Jesus are occasions of joy. When Gabriel told Zechariah his son John the Baptist was coming, he said John would be a joy to them and many would rejoice at his birth. Why joy? Well, joy for Zechariah and Elizabeth because they were past childbearing age and they always wanted uh, a child and now they're going to have one. So they have that joy. But people will rejoice because he's the forerunner to the Messiah. He's the one who's going to prepare the way for the one that God has promised to the earth. Joy because he is the forerunner to the Messiah. John the Baptist, while still in the womb, leaps for joy when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth. You remember again in Luke chapter 1. And John leaps for joy knowing who is in the womb of Mary. Mary rejoices for the work of God in her life. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 47, she, has, she says this, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And when the angels appear to the shepherds, he brings them good news of what? Great joy. Great joy. Not just a little bit of joy or some joy. It is great joy. And as you read through this text, I find it quite fascinating because when the angel first appears, right, the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with fear. That's what our text in the English says. If you have the NIV or the, uh, the English Standard Version, which is what our Pew, Bi Pew Bibles are. We also note that uh, they had a, not just this big joy, they had a big fear. A great fear. The word to describe great joy is the same word that is used to describe the fear that they have. It is a great fear. But what overcomes mega fear is mega joy. What overcomes mega fear is mega joy. And this word mega in the Greek means big, exceedingly great, greatest, high, large, loud, mighty, strong. It's a lot of joy. Right? Maybe you hear these days as we head towards Christmas about a mega sale or a mega deal. What about mega joy? Mega joy, that is what the angel of the Lord is describing to these individuals. And when they first see the angels, it said they are filled with fear. The NIV says they're terrified. In the King James, it says that they are sore afraid. And then we see in a, uh, another translation that is filled with terror. The literal translation here is that they feared a great fear. They feared a great fear. But the angel didn't come to make them afraid. He came to give them great joy. The coming of the Messiah is a momentous occasion. A couple of years later, when the wise men eventually arrived to see Jesus, when Mary and Joseph are living in a house in Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 2, they'd been following a star and it stopped to rest over the house where Mary, Joseph, and Jesus were now living. And let's look at what the text says, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 10. When they arrived at the house, it says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It's joy that takes place. Because of the coming of the Messiah. The coming of Jesus is the great and momentous event in world history and it is filled with joy. This should not be lost on us. We should never read through these very familiar 
uh, narratives about the birth of Jesus and just kind of, you know, gloss over them. Because they are telling us about this incredible event that takes place and it should inspire us to be joyful as well. If we move through Christmas especially and we don't have a lot of joy, we are missing something, right? We need to be a joyful people, a people of mega joy. Because that is what Jesus has brought, his coming. We see all of these individuals. When we get to the resurrection as well, it says that they had joy. When Jesus ascends into heaven after everything that he has done on earth, there is great joy. Joy. The life of Jesus begins with his coming, great joy, and ends with his ascension, which is also great joy. We need to be a people of joy. It's really that simple. Secondly, coming to Jesus results in joy. Coming to Jesus results in joy. The coming of Jesus is accompanied by great joy because when we come to Jesus, we gain great joy. And this joy is not only experienced by those who put their faith in Jesus, but also in the heavenly realms. Isn't that remarkable? Think about Luke chapter 15 for a moment. Luke chapter 15 is the one that has uh, the parable of the lost sheep. It has the parable of the lost coin, and it has the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son. And if you read it carefully, you actually find out that both of the sons are lost in Luke chapter 15. But what we are told is that when there is one sheep that has gone astray, when there is one sheep who is lost, the shepherd goes after the one sheep. Even though he's got 99 safe ones, he doesn't think, oh well, I I can lose a sheep, it's fine, I've got a bunch of others. No, he doesn't do that. He goes and he finds the other sheep, and he rescues the sheep, and he rejoices. But not only does he rejoice over that sheep, Jesus uses that as an analogy that when one person who is lost comes to Christ, there is great celebration in heaven. Notice what it says in chapter 15 and verse 6. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Isn't that amazing? When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, there is a party in heaven. There is a celebration because you found your way home. You had found your way back to God through Jesus. That is a momentous occasion. Anytime someone becomes a believer, that is a miracle. And it's one that is celebrated in heaven. The pair of the lost coin, here's a woman. She had 10 silver coins, probably part of uh, her dowry when uh, she got married. If she loses one coin, what does she do? She sweeps the house. She turns everything uh, upside down in order to to find it. She seeks diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Verse 10, Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Joy. Joy for the sinner who repents, who recognizes they are going in one direction away from God and they need to turn that direction and they do by the influence of the Holy Spirit and they put their faith in God and there is rejoicing. What does this tell us about God? Sometimes we have this picture of God that he's just kind of up in heaven and uh, you know, in the, the Greeks would call him the, uh, the unmovable or the, the great mover, but he's unmovable himself, right? That, that God is kind of passive with his emotions, things just kind of happen and God is stoic, That's not what this passage tells us. This passage tells us that God is is excited when people get saved. That God experiences that joy when people get saved. Every time someone comes to Jesus, there's joy, and that is exemplified by the Father. You know the story, Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. The son decides that uh, he doesn't want to wait for his father to die, so he goes to his dad and says, Dad, give me my inheritance. It's kind of rude, right? It's a little rude. Okay, because the dad's still alive. The dad says, okay, you, here's your inheritance. Go, you know, do, do what you want to do. Live how you want to live. 
And so the son does, and he goes and he squanders his wealth on uh, partying and women, essentially, is what he does. And he ends up uh, working for another farmer, and he has to look after the pigs. Now think about that for a Jewish boy to have to look after a bunch of pigs. Right? He's kind of sunk as low as he can go. He recognizes that his servants, his father's servants, have a better life than he does. So he has this big plan in his head that he's going to go back to his dad. He's going to apologize. And he's going to say, Dad, just let me be one of your servants. And so he goes back to his dad. And what do we read about the dad? Is the dad just sitting at home thinking, oh, I can't believe my son. What in the world is he doing? If he comes back, there's no way I'm going to let him back. Is that what the dad thinks? No. The dad is waiting on the road, looking, right? He's looking. Is my son coming back? Is he coming back? Is he going to return home where he can be safe and looked after? I love my son and I want to see him. And then off in the distance, he sees his son. And what does he do? Does he wait for his son to come to him? No. He runs. He runs to his son and embraces him. Two things about running. When you get older, you run less, right? Right? Anybody broken into a full sprint recently? Number two, rich people don't run. This man is wealthy and he is older. He runs to his son and embraces him and welcomes him back. And when his son tries to get out his apology, his dad doesn't let him. He lets him come back. And then he decides, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a party because my son has returned. Now, the other son isn't that happy. The other son is kind of self-righteous, and he's upset. He's upset that his brother has come back. But but notice the explanation that his dad gives. In verse 30 of Luke 15, But when this son of... Sorry, this is the, the... other brother, when the son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf. Dad, this guy has wasted your money. He's blown it. Why are you giving him a second chance? The father says, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and to be glad for this brother that your brother was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is found. What's the victory? That the son came to his senses and returned to the father. Sometimes we're more like the prodigal son's brother than the prodigal son. We can write people off because they've made terrible mistakes and we can't even believe they're doing what they're doing. But the Father says no. Let us celebrate that he is returned. Let us celebrate that he has come to his senses, that he is repenting, and now he has joined us again. So celebrate and be glad because coming to Jesus results in joy. Acts chapter 8 Acts chapter 8, this is also a tremendous chapter. Luke wrote wrote Acts as well. In Luke's chapter 8, the church is being scattered. It's after the uh, execution of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. The church scatters because it's dangerous, and as they scatter, they go and they proclaim the gospel, and Philip goes from uh, Jerusalem to Samaria. And listen to this in verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him. And they saw the signs that he did for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. There is joy because the work of Christ is being done, because the gospel is being proclaimed, and people are responding, and they respond with joy. Now, these are Samaritans. Samaritans and Jews did not like each other. And Philip, a Jewish man, goes on his way, and he decides, I'm going to go preach in Samaria, and he does, and lives are changed by the gospel of Christ. And there is joy. 
and there is joy. Turn over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, this is Paul and Barnabas. They are preaching in the city of Antioch of Pisidia, which is in Turkey, not Antioch in Syria, which has become kind of the the home base of the church uh, in the uh, New Testament. And in Acts chapter 13, in verses 48 to 52, after Paul has preached... It says, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Because the word of God was being preached and people were coming to Jesus. And it's the Gentiles. It's the Gentiles that Paul is preaching to. Though they faced opposition, those who received the gospel did so with great joy. Why? Because they received eternal life. If you have received eternal life, if I have received eternal life, we have joy and should reflect that joy that we have received from Jesus. We are to be a joyful people. Finally, Christian joy is a quality grounded in God and helps us to purse a year. Joy is not an emotion. It is deeper than that and it transcends happiness. It should characterize our lives on earth and also anticipates being with Christ forever. We can be joyful even in trials. You ever read James 1, 2? It's kind of strange, isn't it? Consider it pure joy, pure joy when you face trials Of many kinds. I don't know. I don't like trials. Anybody with me on that? I had rather not go through any trials. That would, wow, that would be so much better in life. But we can't do that. It never happens. But here James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because as you go through the trial, the trial is not the joy. It is the work of God that is being done through that trial that brings joy because through those trials we become steadfast in our faith. The result of the trial will be growth in our faith. The trials help us become stronger Christians. And that's why we can be joyful in trials. Because we know that God is still working. Not only is he working through that trial, he's working through you. He's working in you. Shaping you to become more like his son each and every day. What about Jesus? Jesus, of course, as always, is the great example. Right? Hebrews chapter 12. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before him. Now was the cross something that Jesus enjoyed? No. But the result of him going to the cross and dying for our sins and rising again, there's joy on the other side because people can be saved. That's where the joy is. Jesus knew the results of what it would mean for him to go to the cross. That's why he could endure it. He knew he would be vindicated by the Father. He would be raised from the dead. He would ascend into heaven to be seated at God's right hand. He knew that going to the cross would open doors, the door for millions and millions of people to be saved, and for that we can be joyful. That's where our joy comes from. Listen to what Jesus says in John 16, 22. John 16, 22. John 16 context, it is the Last Supper, and Jesus is about to go to the cross, he's about to die, and so 
from John 13 to John 16, we get an inside glimpse of what's going on during the Last Supper where Jesus teaches his disciples. He says this. Let's back up to verse 21. Verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice to the death of Jesus. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but she has delivered, when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Because Jesus is one. When he sees them again, he is risen from the dead. And no one can change that. That can't be changed. And so we have this joy because of the eternal victory that Jesus has won on the cross and through his resurrection. So Jesus says, no one can take your joy from you. No one. Because what I've done is permanent and it is eternal. That's remarkable. That is remarkable. Our joy is rooted in God. Our joy is rooted in Christ. Our joy is rooted in God's promises. And our joy is rooted in the advancement of the gospel and when people respond to it. Those are the things we rejoice in. The nature and properties of this joy that we receive from Jesus Christ It is, and I like this comment, or should be constant. Because let's face it, we don't always feel joyful. But joyful isn't just an emotion that comes and goes, it's a state of being. Because whatever we're going through, Jesus has done the work to secure our eternity. So our joy should be constant. It is unknown to the men of the world and women of the world. Other people don't understand how Christians can be joyful in difficult times. Have you ever had that experience with someone? Where they come to you and say, man, your life is kind of a mess. Why are you still happy? Why, why are you still okay? I would be a puddle on the floor, but somehow you're able to keep going. Why is that? Well, because of Jesus. That's the answer. Because of Jesus. Usually, in my experience, the conversation ends at that point. Right? Maybe you've had better experiences to go on and explain that. But that is the answer. Because of Jesus, someone who is not saved cannot experience the joy of Jesus. They don't have it. It's unknown to them. First Peter 1 Peter 1.8, it's unspeakable. It is so great. It is so mega. It is so incredible that I can't even put into words what this joy that I've experienced in Christ is like. I can try, but I'll never do it justice. And then the last one, just like peace, it is permanent. It's permanent. We always have it because of Jesus. So let's conclude. Because of Jesus, we are to abound in hope We gain a peace that passes all understanding and we obtain mega joy. We have a hope that we are to abound in. We have a peace that passes all understanding and we obtain mega joy. Let's hear what Robbie Castleman has to say. What would happen today, this week, this semester, this year, This lifetime, if Christians were truly grateful and said so, how would our family gatherings, boardrooms, faculty meetings, shopping malls, parks, highways, neighborhoods, and mission fields be transformed by gratitude expressed with joy? How would the voice of the church be heard as a herald of the kingdom's coming if we remember that it is a wedding feast? Would the world turn its head and begin to listen if Christians began to catch the rhythm of eternal joy, of eternal shalom? 
with the sinner, the sorrowful, the sojourner, the cynic, the bored to death, and the sick of life take notice of a joy so gigantic that it couldn't fail to love them. I don't know about you, but if as a church we can show that kind of joy and that kind of peace and that kind of hope to this world, well, some lives are going to get changed. Some lives are going to get changed. So let us remember, we have been given a great joy And let us show it to the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have just gone through a lot of scripture that shows us the joy that Jesus brings, the joy that accompanied his birth, the joy that accompanies when one sinner comes to repentance, the joy that is seen in cities when the gospel is preached, the joy that Jesus gives, that he is secured, that is permanent and eternal, that should be us. We should be reflecting that each and every day. When things are hard, when things are challenging, let us not forget the joy that you have given us. nor the peace, nor the hope. And next week, as we'll see, the love. Lord, these are all things our world desperately needs. And the world is looking in all the wrong places. Lord, all of these things are transcendent. And there is a longing in each and every one to have a hope that is secure, to have a peace that passes all understanding, to have mega joy. Who wouldn't want those things? And through Jesus, that is exactly what you have promised. So Lord, I pray that you will just stir in us through your Holy Spirit, that we will reflect on these things and if we have not been hopeful, if we have not been peaceful, if we have not been joyful the way your word describes, may we repent and ask you to make that difference in our lives. And as a result, may we see changes in those around us because they're seeing the difference that Jesus makes. Lord, we thank you for these reminders. We thank you for this Advent season. I pray, Lord, that we will just allow ourselves to be changed and moved by you to know that we have these things from you already. We pray all these things in your Son's holy and precious name.